Welcome back from the break, everyone. Hope you had a lovely step away from your computer or a social time in the, any of the chat channels or um, whatever it is that you like to do in your online conference breaks. Um, next up, we have Randall Crook um, telling us how open source and hardware has changed retro computing. So Randall is a Unix system administrator with a checkered background in electronics integration and Nix admin. Recently he has become inter more interested in retro computing, gathering an eclectic collection of old computers and modern clones of 8-bit systems. And now he has been playing some interesting open projects um, that have impacted his hobby in retro computing. So Randall will be answering questions at the end. Uh, so please put your questions in the um, questions tab in Venulus and I will pass them on to Randall at the end of the talk. Um, I think this is going to be a fun one. So enjoy everyone. Over to you, Randall. G'day. Um, I'd like to acknowledge that I'm meeting with you today from the lands of the Ngunnawal people. I also acknowledge the traditional custodians of various lands on which you are all participating today and pay respect to the elders past, present and emerging and extend that respect to other Aboriginals joining us today. Today I want to talk to you about my hobby, but a bit about me first. I'm, as Betsy said, I'm a systems Just, uh, just to let you know, uh, Randall, we've had a sound card drop out on you. Uh, your audio's dropped out. So um, might just want to uh, go to cam mic settings and um, swap sound card out and swap it back again and just see. There we go. I think you're back. Hello. Oh, we can hear you. I can hear you. Okay. We're good. Thanks, mate. Okay. So my background in computing in general starts back... Um, when I was in high school, actually, the first ever computer I touched or used was an Apple IIe at my high school. Um, the first ever computer I actually owned was a second-hand Sinclair ZX81. And if anybody's ever had uh, a play with this as the ZX81, you'll know it's not a particularly useful computer. It is useful for learning about um, BASIC and, and how home computers work. From there I went to a Commodore 64 and I'm pretty sure a large number of the people who are watching this at the present moment have used a Commodore 64. Mine only had a tape unit and the favourite game on it was the um, shuttle simulator and boy did it take time to load off the tape. Up until that point I wasn't overly impressed with, with um, computing because at the same time as I had them, I was working for a company that actually had a couple of NCR towers which ran Unix System 5 Release 3. They were in 68,000 base machines with 2 megabytes of RAM and 20 megabyte hard drives. They impressed me. Having multiple users running different work, different programs, as they were called back then, that's what I thought was computing. Then about 1986, I bought my first Amiga, and it was the original Amiga. They wrote and later renamed it to the Amiga 1000, and I loved it. I was sold. That felt like computing. It had preemptive multitasking. It had a, a beautiful GUI, interfa GUI interface well before its time, and I loved that computer. I even upgraded to the Amiga 500 a, a few years later and I'm kicking myself now because I didn't keep it. I actually gave it away to a friend. Anyway, in the early 90s I moved on to working with PCs and the PC domination sort of flooded in and all of the old computing systems that I had either vanished, were given away or sold and I was stuck with PCs. Um, fast forward to 2019 and I was sitting there in a fit of nostalgia on eBay looking for a HP 5036A 
which is a microprocessor lab. It's a processor trainer that I was using when I was doing my associate diploma back in the late 80s, early 90s, and couldn't find one. Um, the ones I'd seen that had been sold recently were going for ridiculous amounts of money, so, so I was very disappointed. And then I came across a printer circuit board being sold by a gentleman not far from Canberra. Um, he discovered Talking Electronics, uh, a magazine which had been released um, that had a, had a run through the early 80s and a couple of gentlemen here in Australia designed a single board Z80 computer for the magazine. The gentleman I stumbled across on eBay in 2019 had actually updated the printed circuit board and had a bunch made primarily for himself but he was selling the the others on eBay. I bought one and I built it and it was the beginning of my trip back down memory lane. I then bought a couple of um, old apples uh, an Apple IIc and a Mac Classic off a friend of mine. Tim, thanks very much for them. I then proceeded to restore them. And then I got immersed into the retro computing YouTube channels. There's quite a few out there if you haven't had a look. I'm sure most of you know the one I'm about to mention, which is the Retro Man Cave. Neil, back in October 2019, did a video about the newest Amiga 500. On there, he built an Amiga 500 using a replica board that had been designed by Rob Taylor and was being sold for people to go out and build their own Amiga 500s. And of course, I had to buy the board. I'm an Amiga fan. I bought one. I scraped it all together and first powered it up in May 2020 and it went straight to the Kickstart screen, as you can see there. Of course, it wasn't perfect. I still had no sound, but it didn't take me long to figure out what was wrong with the sound and get it working. The Omega 500 Plus Plus will play a part in this talk. And this is it. This is the finished product. Um, it took me about three weeks to build after I'd got all the components together. It was thrown together with bits of old computers which were no longer working, um, a German keyboard, which I managed to get off eBay, and it works beautifully and this is the basis or the base platform that I use to discover some very interesting open source projects. Let's take a bit of a diversion here and talk about the Pi invasion of the retro computing uh, community. One of the biggest issues with playing with retro computing is the vanishingly scarce peripherals required to get some of these computers to work. And the Pi has been used for the basis of a number of very useful um, peripheral recreations or emulations, like the Pi 1541, which emulates a uh, Commodore 1541 floppy drive. You've also got the Ra SCSI, which uh, emulates a whole bunch of different types of SCSI devices for any of the systems that can actually support SCSI. And there is also a Commodore tape emulator used using a Raspberry Pi. But the two I'm talking about today are the RGB H to HDMI and the Pi Storm. These two uh, projects that a focused uh, that may be used, in, in fact, can be used on a, a number of different uh, retro platforms. But in my case, I'm looking at the the, the derivations require uh, derivations specifically for the Amiga. The RGB HDMI. Its primary focus, when it was originally started, was to enable people to to view the output of older computers on modern monitors. The uh, retro monitors of the time are CRT based ones and they're becoming harder and harder to source. They're becoming harder to repair and when you do find them on eBay and on 
the different marketplaces, they usually attract a very large sum of money. There are other there are other projects out there at the present moment which will do upscaling and, and video conversion for these old, older products or older computers, but they usually are fairly expensive. Things like the OSSC, which is another open source one, um, at the present moment they go for about $150 Australian to buy. Very good, but expensive. And on top of that, many of the old computers actually have either proprietary or very esoteric video standards. Uh, I'm looking at the video standard of, of uh, HP 9000 at the present moment, which I don't have anything which can convert it just yet, but I will find something. And the Pi is, the reason they're using the Pi is because, number one, the Pi Zero in particular is cheap, 20 odd bucks here in Australia. It's a known platform that's been used extensively, not just in retro computing, but across the entire technology um, field. It's got an open development environment. It's cheap to sit down and develop um, interfaces that use the Raspberry Pi to handle things like video or SCSI or older networking protocols. This is the one for the Amiga 500. As you can see, it's not particularly large. It doesn't appear to be very complex, and it isn't. It's essentially just some 7.4 series logic chips and uh, a level conversion um, from the 5 volts TTL on the Amiga 500 to the 3.3 volt um, uh, levels required by the Raspberry Pi. It's designed to be small to fit underneath the graphics chip of the Amiga 500. Um, it's the graphics chip's called Denise. Uh, the the five hundred the the actual um, board sits underneath the the Denise. The Denise plugs into that, and then the Raspberry Pi plugs into that. And you may be able to see the black ribbon cable. That's actually a HDMI cable that runs from the Raspberry Pi to a, an external HDMI port in a in a 3D printed clip-on case, so it's to not to damage the the actual case. And this is what the output looks like. This was actually captured by a very cheap HDMI capture card. Um, and it's the Amiga's running in its high resolution interlace mode. And if anybody remembers running the interlace modes on the old CRTs, it was terribly annoying the amount of flicker the interlace introduced. Well, it's, it's good to hear that they've actually removed the flicker using the RGB to HDMI. No flicker at high resolution. Looks awesome. The next the next project I'm going to talk about, which is another open project, is the Pi Storm. At its heart, it is a drop-in replacement for the Motorola 68000 CPU. I mean, they're still available and they're not overly expensive, but what this allows you to do using the, the EMP240 CPLD and a bunch of 74 series latches and transceivers is to actually emulate not just the 68000 but the later revisions and the later versions of the 68K series like the 030 and the 040. It uses a Raspberry Pi 3A Plus primarily to get the performance required for emulating a 68000 CPU but also it's a very low profile which means it'll fit just inside a, an Amiga 500 case. This is what the Pi Storm looks like. As you can see, it's got the CPLD and a bunch of latches, 74 series latches, and some interfacing. Um, once again, interfacing circuitry with a level um, shifter. Once again, because of the 5 volt to 3.3 required by the Amiga, uh, the Raspberry Pi. And it is, once it's together, just fits underneath the keyboard of the A500. It, as I said earlier, it can emulate anywhere up to a 68040 running at uh, 
it runs at about seven or eight megahertz it's hard to tell because it's a user land um, emulation program running on the Pi but it can give you quite a good performance as seen on here it can emulate uh, or it can it can get performance better that just better than the the, the 4000 running in 040 at 20 25 megahertz this is in its current form they are working on an emulation um, an emulation program at the present moment which should increase the performance greatly but the Pi Storm is not just an accelerator it does a hell of a lot more when you think that there is a Raspberry Pi sitting on top of the the CPLD and controlling it you can do a lot more things ra from the Raspberry Pi itself and you can set up virtual ROM images and be able to change change them in the configuration from Kickstart 1.3 to the very latest Kickstart 321 plus Diag ROMs etc you can map up to 128 megabytes of RAM into the fast RAM area of the Amiga you can map virtual SCSI disks which are images um, that can be used within the Amiga emulator to virtual SCSI drives within the Amiga itself there is um, a directory a Pi resident or Pi file system resident directory mapping facility so you can actually map a directory from the Raspberry Pi's file system to a virtual SCSI or a virtual disk within the Amiga OS you can also fire up a shell from the Pi within the Amiga OS shell and there is another part which I haven't haven't been able to get working as yet which is the retargetable graphics which allows for high resolution graphics on the Amiga via the Pi G GFX um, library through the HDMI output of the Pi and one of the most useful is you can now use the Pi Storm to gateway into the internet via the Pi's Wi-Fi so if you're running a TCP stack on your Amiga you can actually connect to the internet and of course they've thrown in the real-time clock as well now it's time for a short video demonstration I'll, I'll talk over this and, and you'll see some of the pluses and minuses the first part is the power on which is a minus it can take anywhere up to a minute the reason for this is the the Pi Storm holds the reset line on the Amiga low until the Pi is fully booted and the emulator software is actually running on it then it releases it and the system will then boot and as you can see this uh, this is my A500 plus plus it boots up once it gets to that point it boots up pretty quickly and to show an example but just how quickly it can boot I'll do a reset here and from the three finger con uh, salute back to useful is about 25 seconds which is not bad for the for the old Omega 500 The next thing I'll, uh, I'm demonstrating here is the actual use of an Amiga or the Pi Storm's networking capabilities. AWeb is a very old web browser made in the in the 90s for the Amiga. And if you get a chance, have a look at FrogFind.com. It's a it's a search engine specifically designed for retro um, browsers, and it uses the uh, Mozilla Reader library to strip everything out that a um, retro browser like this one would not like and as you can see you can browse um, github if you want using it and the Omega 500 I mean it's still a bit slow even with the the acceleration but hopefully that'll be resolved with the new em emulation engine and of course no demonstration um, no demonstration of the Pi Storm will, will, would be without the sysinfo this will give you a quick rundown as you can see it thinks it's a, a 68040 with a, a 6 uh, 6882 mass coprocessor 
It's got the 128 megabytes of RAM plus 2 megabytes of chip RAM. It's got all the um, different drives connected, both physical and the Pi SCSI virtual ones. And we can do a speed check. And it comes up with um, just over 20,000 20, dry stones, which is pretty impressive for an Amiga 500. And the performance of the actual virtual drives is still pretty impressive too, 20, 25 megabytes per second. And lastly, oh, not lastly, but I will now show you a demonstration of its sound. It still works. Soundtrack it still works and we'll play an old um, mod from a, a game called Crystal Hammer and you'll be able to see that the Pi Storm still supports the sound and everything. Lastly I'll show you the, um, the virtual disk maps to a directory within the Raspberry Pi which makes it very very useful you can actually use SSH or even Samba to uh, share a directory within the Pi itself on the Pi Storm and everything in that directory will be accessible from within Amiga OS it's a bit slow but they are trying to fix the performance on on the um, shared directories as you can see, that's the you do it essentially. You mount the virtual drive, which is called Pi Zero. Um, it'll then show up on the the workbench. You can then open that up and have a look at it. In on the Raspberry Pi it's, uh, itself, that's an SSH connection into the Raspberry Pi. As the um, Amiga is running, there's a, a directory which is mapped to the Pi disk on the workbench. We can create a file here, just a, an ordinary text file at this particular point. Just anything in it doesn't particularly matter. And when you refresh on the Amiga 500, refresh the directory, um, in this case I'm just going to close the window and, and reopen it you'll find that the file is now there available within Amiga OS and that's while the system is running so very very useful for transferring data on and off the Amiga and you don't have to swap disks or pull SD cards or whatever and that of course is all running over the the, net, the, the Wi-Fi of the Raspberry Pi And that's it for, for the demo, and we'll move back on with the talk, and I'll do a quick wrap-up. You've got to understand the PyStorm project is still in beta. Um, there are still lots of, lots of hardware and software compatibility issues that, that you'll come across. Um, the power-on boot time is, is one of the most annoying things, but it can be fixed by going in and tuning the, the version of uh, Linux that you're running on your Pi. Um, the one I've got there cost me a total of $70 when I originally bought it. That's the Raspberry Pi plus the Pi Storm. The present moment with the chip shortage there, they're running at about $100 full for a Pi Storm and the, the actual uh, Raspberry Pi. So it is well worth looking at if you've got a 500 and you want to expand it. Well worth looking at that particular project. The next thing I want to talk about is a very interesting um, project, open project, which is impacting the home homebrew or retro brew commu uh, computer um, community. It's called Ron WBW. The com you've got to understand that the the retro and homebrew community has been around for a long time. Um, its roots go back to the computer enthusiast clubs of the 60s and 70s. In fact, Apple's very first product was aimed at the, the members of those clubs, which was the Apple I. The desire to tinker with your stuff um, has not died. It's, instead, it's actually getting stronger. All you have to do is look at the number of maker clubs out there. 
Um, but at the same time, the technology uh, complexity is, is fast surpassing the hobbyist's ability. And that's where the retro in homebrew com community comes from, because it's using the old computer technology. And in this particular case, the ROM WBW is aimed at the Z80 based processor. It's an 8-bit processor which is still being made today. You can still buy brand new Z80s in the DIP40 package. There is an immense amount of data and information available for the Z80. It's been around for so long, it's accumulated so many fans and uses, both commercial and, and um, open, um, that it's very easy as a starting point for your own computer if you feel like building one. And there is a, a still a large variety of, of development platforms out there. You can do what most do, which is the assembler, um, which is not particularly good, but it is a well-known assembling, uh, it is a well-known instruction set and very, very straightforward to use. And there is an immense amount of, of software which is out there still. Um, in fact, you can build a Z80-based computer very simply, even into a very small computer. That's a, an SCS-130, which I'll talk about later on. And there's, I mean, there's plenty of CPUs you can certainly choose as the basis of a, of a homebrew computer. I mean, there's 68,000, 65, the 68,000, the 6800, the 6502, the 1802. They're all still relatively easy to pick up and they're all relatively easy to program for. And there is a lot of things, a lot of plat, um, programming languages you can actually use on them. Now, Apart from what I've mentioned, the other attractiveness of the Z80 is its, is its um, place in computing history. There was an awful lot of Z80-based computers released at the, at the beginning of the 80s and right through until the 90s. Um, the K-Pro Luggables, for example, the Osborne one. And right now, there is in fact an operating system you can buy, or sorry, you can download for a Z80-based computer, and it's available free of charge, and it is now open source, and that's CPM. The CPM, um, which was created in 1974 by Digital Research, it's a predecessor of DOS, and has changed hands a few times, but when Caldera owned it in 1970, in the 1990s, they released CPM 2.2 binaries and source code under, under an open source license. So it is now open source. And it is an advanced operating system for, for, for retro computers. And a lot of retro computers um, are now currently using it. And it's not just the Z80. There's 8085, 8086 and 68,000 versions of CPM available. Now, I want to talk about Wayne Worthen. He's a very smart bloke. I managed to interview him for about an hour for this talk. He has a passion at the present moment for doing the work he is on the ROM WBW. Uh, when he started looking at the homebrew or the retro brew community, he found a lot of the computers that were being made Essentially, it was the developers or the, the designers who wrote their own ROM monitor. And they were fairly, they were, while they were good, they were not particularly versatile. Wayne saw this and he wanted to essentially write a standard for Z80 based retro homebrews or retro brew computers. And his primary motivation was to create a professional level CPM system out of a homebrew computer. Now, his first go at this was um, specifically for the, N the N8VM homebrew computer by A Andrew Lynch. Um, 
and he put that out onto the onto the homebrew forums, and people jumped at it. Um, and he's the first guy who jumped on and and started working with Wayne was uh, Sergey Kisilev uh, for his Zeta single board computer. And after he integrated the Zeta with the help with Sergey, even more people started to talk to him about getting ROM WBW running on their home computers. So what is the ROM WBW? It's, a, it's essentially a BIOS. It's mostly written in uh, Z80 assembler and it gives low-level initialization uh, for, for the system when it first powers on. It supports a bunch of different system uh, peripherals and expansion. It has bootloaders for multiple operating systems, including Fusix, which is Alan Cox's little micro um, Unix-like operating system. Well worth having a look at. It also has the, the BIOS routines required for CPM, um, floppy disk controllers, IDE controllers, SPI and I2C device interfacing functionality as well. So you can actually plug in SPI and I2C um, devices and easily get them integrated into ROM WBW. Plus it's got built in uh, a 300k CPM RAM disk and ROM resident CPM bootable disk. Very basic functionality on the ROM WBW or the, the ROM resident CPM bootable disk, but it works and it works beautifully. And takes us back to the days of days of um, ROM bootable systems on like the old classic Macs etc. The systems it currently supports, as you can see there's quite a few. Um, I've got a few of these including the Zeta 2 and the RC2014 as well as uh, the 126, the 130 and the, the 133. The 133 is the one I showed you here. It's a CPM machine that fits in your pocket. All you have to do is plug it into your USB port. It does have an SD card slot in it as well. But it also has um, VGA and PS2 support using the Parallax Propeller microcontroller. It has the support for sound cards and there are a number of um, video display unit um, projects currently working with Wayne to get them included. Now I don't know how much time I've got left, unfortunately I haven't got my timer here, um, but I was going to do a live demo of one system. I'll start and if Betsy wants to jump in when I run out of time, you might be able to see some of the system, some of the uh, system stuff anyway. Let's have a look. Now this is a, this is the SC126. Um, it, I do have a photo and I'll show, show you once I've done, but at the present moment it, it's running uh, the very latest version of the de development um, branch of the ROM WBW. And when you first power it on, as you see, it comes up with a bunch of um, what you class as post, well it is post information, and then it gives you a summary of what hardware it knows. Um, from here, there's a number of things you can do. Uh, the boot the boot, um, unfortunately, it doesn't list all the, the options in the help. But starting with, say, the uh, monitor program, this is a basic monitor, you know, ROM based monitor, and it gives you your, your monitor functionality if you want to do some debugging. You can actually get this to software reset and leave the RAM alone. So if, you want to, if you've got an issue, you can actually reboot fire up the monitor and actually see what's in RAM. Um, we're going to do a quick dump of um, some RAM here, RAM or ROM. And as you can see it comes up with, um, that's part of the ROM. Then we can move on to something which I think will give, give everyone a bit of a, uh, a giggle. This has ROM resident basic and it is in fact Microsoft's BASIC which was released to public domain quite a few years ago and it's been used uh, quite a bit in the Retrobrew community and yes it is standard 
Microsoft Basic with the standard standard syntax. And we do a list and a run. And off you go. It also has another more advanced version of um, open source basic called tasty basic I won't demonstrate it um, it does have a few extra functions built into it to enable you to do things like um, reading registers and stuff like that from within a basic program it's very useful it also has fourth now I know nothing about fourth at all so I'm just going to show you the banner <laughs> and then I'm going to reboot so if you know fourth this is quite a nice little machine to play with with fourth Another thing it um, has built in is a game. There's a game in here. If you hit P, I have no idea what game it is. I've never played it. I just know it's there. So if you want to play a game on a Z80 using a serial port, this is the machine for you. But we'll get to the, the killer app, which is CPM. Now I've got an SD card on this um, which has got a number of spins of CPM on it. I've also got a there's also the built-in CPM which is 2.2 and I'll fire that up. You hit C, it'll boot up the ROM resident version of CPM and as you can tell it hasn't got an awful lot of things in it but what it does have in it is the tools required if you want to start building up your own disk images it also has a tool for flashing the ROM so if you want to put a new ROM on your, your system you can actually put it into a to a partition on the SD card which is formatted as fat you can copy it across into the RAM disk well you can't because it's too small but you can actually copy it onto an SD card partition and then flash the ROM from within CPM. Very useful. If we go on and have a look at what I've got installed on the SD card, as you can see it's a 16 gigabyte SD card, disk number 6. If you specify which disk you want or which device you want to boot from and then a partition number, I'll use partition 4. And this boots up a um, very much customized version of uh, CPM that it's that has added a whole bunch of more useful to utilities but also a much friendly user interface if we change to one of the other drives here we do a do it now does paging for the directory uh, directory listing which is very useful um, and this is the, the version of CPM I use uh, mostly when I'm actually working on the, the ROM WBW machines I have. There is a, a fat utility, which I believe is on A. Um, no, it's not on A. Here it is here. So I can do it I, on that 16 gigabyte hard, uh, 16 gigabyte SD card. Only the first, I think it's 128 megabytes, is actually used by CPM. It creates a bunch of um, CPM specific uh, partitions at the beginning of the disk. The rest of the disk can then be formatted as FAT and actually used within a. a a modern computer for transferring files across. In this particular case you'll see that I've actually got on here a copy of the ROM for this particular machine. And so what I can actually do is copy that onto uh, one of the CPM partitions. So if we do a fat copy for 126.rom to F drive Oop. 
Oh, I've got a four there that shouldn't be there. Got the four colon 126. F. It will now copy that file. Drive not ready. <laughs> As with all live demos, there's got to be something that goes wrong. <laughs> anyway, once it's copied across onto the um, directory, onto one of the partitions for CPM, you can then actually flash that ROM onto the flash ROM, it's actually a flash ROM that sits here and that's how you upgrade the ROM. How much time have I got left? I think I must be getting pretty close. You've got three minutes and 47 seconds. I would love to I would love to show you the sound card working but unfortunately I cut it because uh, the first run through I did on this was too long. <laughs> um, so what I might do just quickly is is have a look see it um, well actually I'll show you the machine I'm using I'll go back to my slides and you'll be able to see the machine that I've actually been using here let's go back to the slides this is the SC 126 it was designed by a, a very prolific retro brew um, designer by the name of Steve Cousins. I've got links to all of this stuff at the end of the slides and I will release the slides so you can actually go and have a look at this stuff. I bought this on Tindy, it cost about, the machine itself cost me I think it was $220. That's a complete kit. Um, unassembled of course, the fun part is assembling it. That's also using a floppy drive controller that was designed uh, by uh, Scott Baker who did a series of YouTube videos a couple of years back where he messed around and designed bits and pieces for the RC2014. Now the SC126 is designed to, to work with any of the RC2014 modules. So I bought the bits including the board for the for the floppy disk controller and I had a bunch of old 1.44 meg floppy drive drives floating around from the PC days and um, yes it works let me show you booting from the floppy it'll bring back memories I'm sure and the floppy drive is disk number two that's booting CPM from a 1.44 megabyte floppy disk as you can see, it's taking a bit of time. And this is another way of flashing the ROM. You can boot from the floppy disk. You can actually have the ROM image on the floppy. It will fit with the flash tool and you can then flash the, the ROM using the floppy. It takes a little bit of time, but it works, works reasonably well. There is, as I said, CPM is very useful because there is a huge back catalogue of CPM programs. Um, most of them, of course, are business-based ones like um, uh, WordStar and, and VisiCalc and stuff like that. But there is also a bunch of development tools out there as well. Z80 compile um, assemblers, there's a number of compilers. In fact, if I remember correctly, an older version of the GCC will actually cross compile to Z80 um, uh, Z80 assembler. So it's a very useful operating system if you want to mess around. It's very small. It can be very fast. The Z80 or the Z180 processor on the SC126 is in fact running at 18 megahertz um, the RC2014 I believe was running at 4 correct me if I'm wrong sorry Randall we're out of time Time, that's fine and you have quite a few questions in there <laughs> that I'm we sure. don't have time to ask right now um, but, I'll be in there. but there was a very keen audience in the chat um, so if you're happy Randall 
We'll send you and them over to the post talk chat Kaya Theater Text channel in Venulus. We'll copy yep. those questions we didn't have time for over. Um, and I'm sure you'll have a whole gaggle of people wanting to talk about all those things you showed us. No worries. Thank you very much. And thanks, Thank everyone. Thank you so much for your talk. No worries. All right. Um, we'll be back for the next talk after this short break. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks, guys. That was good. Nice one. Had to drop in there at the end. Yes, you had to. Get my medallion out. <laughs> <laughs>